Hello everyone, my name is Stefan Winter. My name is Samar Schiet. And we are from the German collection of microorganism cell cultures and the plant virus departments in Braunschweig. And this is our cassava farm and we would like to invite you to follow a series of seminars that are based on the idea of summer sheet and our discussions in order to share some of our experiences with you on plant virus infecting cassava and in especially to initiate and start and continue a discussion in order to further our understanding of the plant viruses infecting cassava and in particular towards a control strategy. We would like to have very small fragments of video sequences that are focusing on a very particular aspect in cassava viruses. And certainly our experience is mostly on the most critical viruses that we think of cassava in the world, and this is cassava mosaic viruses and the emerging cassava brown strip virus, where we both have quite some experience to work with those viruses and we would like to share some of it. So we will have small seminars, small video sequences that are addressing a very specific issue and we then open the discussion in order to share with you our experience and then to respond to the queries that you might have. The Saga virus collection has been developed over the last 25 years and it comprises mainly viruses concerned with the mosaic disease and viruses associated with brown strip disease, but essentially a diversity of viruses from cassava from all over the world. It is the fundament of all our research that we are doing and here we have the cassava mosaic viruses that range from African cassava mosaic virus to East African cassava mosaic virus. We have East African cassava mosaic Zanzibar virus, East African cassava mosaic Cameroon virus, up until Sri Lankan cassava mosaic virus. Those viruses are virus species, so they have diverse genomes. And the diversity of the genomes is reflected in part by their symptoms and the cassava response. And this is why we have this uh, collection of diverse viruses in order to support our analysis when we look for plant virus resistance. On the other side, since 1995, uh, we have collections of cassava brown strip viruses that we have collected mainly in the region where cassava brown strip virus is prevalent, starting with the coastal regions of Kenya with our first 1997 and 1999 samples from Kenya, Kilif Kilifi and Kwale to cassava brown strip virus from Tanzania, Ugandan cassava brown strip virus from Congo, Rwanda and later us in every area where cassava virus were collected. These two groups are 
the main groups of virus that we have and that we have dealt with, but of course, in our research, we also have collections of, for example, cassava vein mosaic virus. This is a partner, a cowlymore flower virus. We have viruses that are associated with a very important disease in South America, frog skin disease. So we have Torado viruses. We have Pampinovirus sequences identified in 2014 in Malawi. And while those viruses for which we have entire genome sequences and we also have transmission parameters already analyzed, while those viruses may not play a major role in the disease or not associated with the disease, by themselves we are not quite sure whether altogether they are not contributing to a disease syndrome that can aggravate the other symptoms that are caused by respective main virus. As a plant virologist, what we learn is mostly about viruses is from model host plants. So these model host plants are herbaceous hosts where we can easily manipulate viruses, transfer the viruses, transmit the viruses, and we can all concentrate our observation on those model plants, mostly herbaceous hosts. We learn from those model plants and we deduce to the crops. And then we make the experience with the crops, the crops like tomato and cucumbers or cucurbits. So when we deal as a plant virologist with cassava, uh, we also have to learn that cassava is a different crop. So a lot of the experiences that we make with the crops as a virologist cannot necessarily be easily translated to cassava. Cassava is not a potato. Cassava is a root crop. And the viruses that are infecting this root crop are also not necessary the viruses that are easily compared with other viruses despite that they belong to the same genera and sometimes are even quite closely related. So one of the reasons why we have these seminars is that we like to address the viruses and some very, very critical issue around the viruses that concern cassava where we hopefully can then arrange and adjust our thinking in order to find sort of good ways to understand these particular viruses. Now, <clears throat> when we look at a disease symptom in cassava, and as virologists we always say, yeah, mostly symptoms are found on proliferating material. So young plant material freshly sprouting leaves will probably show the fastest symptoms and the more, most pronounced symptoms while older leaves often have this senescence type and then even some leaves would fall off so we don't see the symptoms very well. So always focus on symptoms that are in the younger areas. But how come that you see symptoms on another cassava where the younger symptoms and the younger leaves you don't see any symptom anymore. So that the leaf of the older plant parts show much more pronounced symptoms than the leaves in the young plants. Are these leaves infected? Are they not infected? And what is the difference between a virus that is in this crop and then a virus that is infecting this cassava. And similarly, we also want to address whether a virus that is in this cassava causing this symptom, this symptom is somehow related to a virus that is in this cassava causing a very mild and moderate symptom 
And our question is, are they different? Are they related? Is this resistance? Is this susceptibility? Is this related to the virus? Is it related to the environment? Or are there other factors that we need to concern? As we have seen, we are dealing with quite a diversity of the viruses infecting cassava, the mosaic virus and the brown swing viruses, but one of the questions that we have to address too in our seminars is how does this diversity matter? Is it really an aspect that would shape our thinking concerning also resistance and control strategies? Similarly, where we want to go to our, in our seminar series is to see how these viruses are transmitted. We all have assumed that these viruses are vector-borne viruses, but is that really true? So we really want to ask some critical questions regarding the viruses infecting cassava, their transmission and spread being a consequence then for ecology and environment and disease strategy. And certainly then we would like to also see diversity of the virus concerning resistance in cassava and the cassava plant material that we then can deploy in Africa and elsewhere to combat the disease. When we speak about these two viruses in cassava, so virus belonging to two different genera, having an entirely different biology. We always speak in these seminars contrasting. So we have our main focus is, in this case, the crop, less the viruses. So when we see the infection of cassava mosaic virus, we call this a susceptible plant. And when you can see this infection of the cassava brown streak virus, we see a plant that is vigorously growing, vigorously growing, having symptoms only in the older leaf parts of the plants, while the upper leaves are symptom free. And we will also have a hard time to find the virus in these plants. Now, what is the major difference? First, we have entirely two different phenotypes that would be saying this is a susceptible plant with a lot of symptoms and this is a plant that shows less symptoms and somehow looks as a recovery from the symptoms and we come to an entirely different judgment or assessment of the status of the plant until we harvest. The harvest on, of a cassava that is infected by cassava mosaic virus will be most likely a smaller root, a lighter root, probably also less roots built, while in a cassava brown streak infected plant we see severe root symptoms in an otherwise fairly well developed tubercle. So the tuberous roots of this plant is destroyed, while the tuberous root of this plant remains healthy, however, is most likely quite compromised in size. And this, as a virologist, is a key criteria. And for this, we don't have any examples in virology that can lead us our, in our thinking because viruses that destroy the roots in virology are very, very rare. We have some in sugar beets, we have some in carrots. However, none of those viruses relate in any way 
through the cassava prostate viruses. So when we look at the judgment <coughs> of a resistance or susceptibility status or a virus status of a plant, what we have learned from the mosaic viruses is we have a susceptible plant, we have a plant genotype that generates something that is called in cassava virology a recovery and reversion phenomenon after a symptomatic phase. The plant will recover, showing milder symptoms until the symptoms are completely faded. And of course, we have what is now commonly cultivated and commonly found viruses or genotypes of cassava that are absolutely resistant. Um, I would not say immune because often after an initial infection, initially infected plant uh, leaves would show some symptoms, but this virus infection in this plant is not sustained and the plant remains virus free. If we compare <coughs> the plant responses of and on cassava <coughs> against Brunswick viruses, <coughs> we see that um, the plant breeders mostly have coined um, some terms that I'm not very happy about and that is the term tolerant. So tolerance as a way to describe that the plants despite being infected uh, by the virus would ine in inevitably then come up with roots that show less or no symptoms at all, so no necrosis on the root and the breeders would call them tolerant varieties. As virologists, however, we have to say what is this tolerance assessment based on and during these seminars I also would like to shed a little bit light on this expression tolerance versus resistance versus recovery versus immunity. Cassava mosaic um, Gemini virus have um, quite a diverse virus genomes and these Diversity between the virus genomes is shaped from recombinant events. So recombination events have shaped the genomes and thus the taxonomy has changed and so we are dealing with different species. Within a species, however, the genomes are not very diverse. So we have a, a, quite a diversity between the species, but not within a species. And within a species, the genomes are quite stable. Now, diversity in these genomes is not necessarily expressed in different symptoms. So we have, when we see those Gemini virus in cassava in the field, the symptoms are often quite resembling each other. Only in different varieties one can see slight differences in symptom expression with some showing a brighter or some showing much more severe mosaic than others. Where genome diversity matters is in the response to and the response of the plant to a virus infection. So this plant here uh, is showing the typical Gemini virus, cassava Gemini virus symptoms, leaf curling associated with a mosaic. And this plant here is a type that in a later infection would recover. So recovery from infection would mean that the upper plant parts or some portions of the plant, new branches formed, will eventually be symptom free and virus will be barely detectable. 
So in this recovery type of cassava, which is a genotype that shows recovery, we see that there are differences between the different geminal viruses. So while ACMV viruses are much more mild in the expression, we see that East African cassava mosaic virus, geminal virus are generally more severe on the plants. So genome diversity of cassava viruses can matter in respect to the particular genotype they are invading. However, when we are dealing, and this is the case of an East African cassava mosaic virus, here we see a severe infection of this particular genotype, which is TME117. So we see very severe symptoms of leaf curling, very strong mosaic, yeah, leaf deformation. However, when we have a resistant plant, a CMD2 resistant plant that we have crafted here, we'll see that in this case, we get a complete resistance. So this plant will not respond, this genotype will not respond with recovery. It will be symptom free. Probably in the first stages there may be some symptoms from an invading virus. However, the plant will then be reprogrammed to respond with high resistance. For CMD2 type plant genotype, the diversity of the cassava mosaic viruses does not matter. In other words, genome di diversity of the viruses is not reflected with the plant response because this plant is resistance against all viruses that we know so far causing cassava mosaic virus disease. Genome diversity, however, can also matter in other functions that we don't see or that we don't rapidly see. So we have seen that the, the, the diverse genomes of those drastically diverse genomes of a different species showing recombination mostly in DNA A are not represented by different symptoms. However, other biological functions of a virus can be also targeted. So here we see East African cassava mosaic virus Uganda. So this is not a different species, this is a different strain. And this strain here, okay, is the strain that was responsible for the outbreak in the 80s of this particular virus that affected the at that time planted widely cultivated uh, resistances that were based on recovery and reversion. So the East African cassava mosaic Uganda virus is a virus that has a recombination event in its code protein. So certainly we do, do not see, besides quite drastical symptoms on this susceptible variety, so we don't see very, diff very much differences However, okay, the recombination in the cold protein has had the effect on one side that at the time when the diagnostic was made, the diagnostic said that this is an ACMV virus. However, a recombination in the cold protein might not be reflected in a different symptom because these viruses do not need a code protein to infect and to cause symptoms, but it might have effects on virus transmissibility, which I will later on explain.
So the diversity within and between the Kazava Brunswick viruses, Uganda Kazava Brunswick virus and Kazava Brunswick viruses, to an extent where this is close to the border of the same species. However, at the time, we had sufficient argument to not only use the genome diversity, but also to use biological parameters in order to define that these are different species. As we know, the, the two viruses occur either in single or, as we can see here, in mixed infections. And between single and mixed infections, one could say the symptoms are not that severely and seriously different. The diversity within a species, that is brown streak or Uganda brown streak virus, is fairly limited. So it's not very broad. Also, we have um, signals of diversity. However, I would think that this is normal for a virus that occurs in a vegetatively propagated crop and that does not have bottlenecks through which it has to pass through the, sec the next generation. The virus is maintained in the cuttings taken for the next generation and then and therefore the virus populations, the diversity of the virus genomes are maintained and this creates a level of diversity. So here we are dealing in these viruses with a diversity between the two species that is most likely um, explained by vegetative propagation. However, as we see also with some of the viruses that have been identified, some of the viruses have very particular genomes for which we still have to associate a biological function to the diversity of the genome. So at this moment, we have no indication that the diverse genomes cause diverse phenotypes, more severe or less severe, or that there are other biological pa parameters affected by the diversity that we find in the Kazava Brown Street viruses. When we compare the Kazava Brown Street virus, Uganda, and Kazava Brown Street virus, we see in chronically infected plant that uh, fairly old, several months or even years old, that we have bright symptoms in variety that are susceptible. And of course, because they are old, they lose the older leaves. However, while in the field, and this is often um, a matter of argument, um, it is said that these two viruses causing an indiscriminate disease for us as virologists, that's not true. One, these viruses are different viruses. They have a different invasion strategy. I would say they have a different invasion biology. They also might have differences in transmission and spread. There might be difference in ecology. They may have difference in ecology, which then is probably masked by vegetative propagation and bringing those viruses in different environments. However, what is also very obvious and what I would like to show you is that these two viruses are also different in their symptomatology. So as you see here, this Ugandan Kazava brown streak virus is a virus that causes a blotchy appearance. And this blotchy appearance is from the fact that the invasion of this virus goes directly from the primary veins into the neighboring cells for replication. And then this blotchy 
appearance of the symptoms compared to cassava brown streak virus, the virus that is much faster in the invasion of a plant that uses the secondary or tertiary veins to invade the plant. So as you see here, these streaky symptoms never would appear as blotchy type symptoms as you can see here. So even in the field we have exercised the identification of the two viruses and we are fairly sure that also in the field this is expressed. And this is not new that I'm telling because in very early days in the early publications that have been done in the 30s two different symptom types have already been described. However, it was not assigned to a different virus. So, we have two different symptom types associated with Uganda and cassava Brownswick virus. And when we look at these little plants here, we also can see that these symptom types with the streaks and these symptom types with the blotches refer to two different viruses. This one is a symptom caused by Ugandan cassava Brownswick virus, and this one is the symptom is caused by cassava Brownswick virus. However, as you see here, this group of plants are infected plants where we have infected those plants with infectious recombinant virus clones of cassava and Ugandan cassava Brownswick virus. So all of these virus that you see here are infectious clones causing a disease in their respective cassava lines. And what you see here, in fact, is Ugandan cassava Brownswick virus. It has been exchanged with the, with the gene from cassava Brownswick virus and cassava Brownswick virus in which a critical gene of Uganda virus has been exchanged into and this causes the difference in symptomatology. So from this work that we are doing with recombinant viruses and of course this work already is quite advanced and uh, matured I should say, we can say that we already know in those two viruses the function of particular genes in the pathology the invasion and hopefully also in the transmission. The establishment of viruses in the environment is intrinsically bound to virus spread. So if the virus cannot spread from generation to generation or from plant to plant, the virus is definitely bound to the host plant that is infected. For vegetatively propagated crops, this is less of a problem because the cuttings sustain virus survival. However, for plants that are grown by seeds, virus transmission is a very critical issue and hence for that, mostly vectors are required. For the cassava viruses that we are dealing with, cassava Brownswick virus and cassava mosaic virus, we have here the vector Bermisia tabaki. This Bermisia tabaki, as you can see here, we see the adults can lay lots and lots and lots of eggs. And those Bermisia tabaki populations spread the two viruses, this that we are talking about in different ways, which we will reflect upon now when we look at the different diseases.
because of uh, mosaic gemina viruses, uh, viruses that are whitefly transmitted, or we can also call them whitefly born. Those viruses in this genus, the Gomo virus, are all very closely related. And the ones that are most closely related to our cassava mosaic, the Gomo virus are the leaf curl viruses, the tomato leaf curl viruses that occur, of course, in tomato. And you see here curling or more severe curling is already an indication that these viruses replicate in the phloem, and thus this causes this constriction of the leaf area. All these viruses are closely related, and all these viruses are transmitted by Bemisia tabaki. The different Bemisia tabaki species transmit these viruses, and in, fa in fact, what we see here are all diseases that we have transmitted artificially by our white fly populations. So what is the specific of this transmission? First of all, from the virus side, this transmission is governed by the code protein. So we know that the code protein of the Goma virus is very, very crucial for white fly transmission. The code protein of the Goma virus, however, is not crucial for infection. So a virus that does not have a code protein can infect the plant and it causes a very similar symptom and this is the reason why those viruses are often used for virus-induced gene silencing, so to express foreign genes with the replicating virus. However, a functional coprotein is required for white fat transmission, and a functional coprotein is also required, of course, for the virion structure, which is a geminate virus particle. So what is very important is that we also know that in the virus code protein of Gemini viruses, we have particular areas that are protruding, and we certainly know a little bit more about this because we know that in an area of the amino acid position around 130, so in between 129 to 133 of those 258 or so amino acids, if there's any mutation introduced, and we have a proof for that, the virus is no more transmitted. We know a little bit more that the virus is no more transmitted, also the virion is made in some of the mutants, but also the virion is not stable in others. So what is very crucial and very important is that the genomes of Gemini viruses have code proteins that are invariable. And the reason why they are invariable is because any change would most likely abolish or bring the virus in danger that it's no more transmitted. So this gene, a functional code protein required for the virus white fat transmission is invariable. And this is why, for example, many of those viruses are also serologically very tightly related. And if we look at the code protein genes by itself, they're almost identical. So what we have here is that the virus is invariable in its code protein. And if we now look from a tomato virus and compare tomato virus with a Gemini virus infecting cassava, we ask ourselves the question, so why does the code protein 
how does the cold protein compare with the cassava mosaic virus? And indeed, this is identical. So also, the cold protein of cassava mosaic virus is practically invariable. And this is because the cold protein has multiple functions. And not only the transmission has to be retained, but also most likely other functions that are important and for which we probably don't know that much. Hence, also for the cassava mosaic viruses, the cold protein is not very variable because most likely a mutation in the cold protein would deter other functions. The gomoviruses are transmitted in a circular persistent mode of transmission and this is the virus will be acquired by the white fly passages through the esophagus into the filter chamber gets released pressed through the filter chamber in the hemocell, cell and then adheres to the primary salivary gland before it gets reinjected so it has to passage the insect before and what it also means, it is retained in the insect for almost the entire lifetime. That is, an adult insect acquires the virus, and this virus, adult insect, this viruliferous insect, is transmitting the virus through an entire lifespan, and this for a white fly is somewhere between 15 and 40 days. So, the gomoviruses are enormously efficiently transmitted by white flies. And in many ways, single white flies can already transmit the disease, in particular tomato yellow leaf curl diseases, and can cause already an epidemics. Combined with an extremely proliferous insect that instantly lays eggs, we can develop populations in a very, very short time so that then the outbreak is supported by large numbers and large populations of white flies. So this circular transmission pathway also comes through for cassava. And we have to ask ourselves that in the open field, white fly control is almost impossible to do and combined with the effect that we only need a few white flies to cause an epidemic, white fly control and virus control can only most likely be sustained with resistant plants. In contrast to the Begoma virus that are, in, uh, are infecting cassava, we have the cassava brown streak Ebola virus infecting cassava, and here we have a completely different pictures. The cassava brown streak virus infecting cassava are semi-persistently transmitted, and that is the virus is required, acquired, and this takes usually a few minutes to a few hours, for the brown streak virus rather a few hours, and is retained in the head part, it's called the cibarium, again for a few hours, and then lost within the first probing. So it's not retained with a flying insect flying from the plant to the plant to the plant, but rather is acquired and then rejected. Required and then ejected to infect the plant. So this Transmission biology is entirely different and it's very important that we do not mix this. When we compare the pomovirus transmission with the pegomovirus transmission, we realize that on one side the pegomovirus transmission is enormously effective, while the transmission of the pomoviruses needs and requires very high amount of Gamesia specimen in order to transmit the virus and to cause a disease, while only few specimen are needed to transmit the cassava mosaic viruses to another plant. These high numbers required 
for the cassava brown streak viruses also compared with low numbers required for the cucumber vein yellowing virus, Epoma virus, points our interest also to another aspect. One, we can ask ourselves how much the coat protein is required and what elements of these coat proteins are required if we consider that the coat proteins between these two viruses are very related. On the other hand, we also can com combine the biology of these two viruses. This cucumber vein yellowing virus uh, is infecting cucumber and zucchini and melons and other cucurbit crops that are seed born, so seed propagated. So thus in order for the virus to survive, to sustain, to establish in the environment, to be transmitted from generation to generation, it requires the white fly. So thus, a white fly transmission is of utmost significance for this virus. While for the cassava, become, uh, for the cassava, cassava epomo viruses, transmitted through cuttings, through vegetative propagation from plant to plant, to the next generation, to the next season, this factor, this white fly transmission factor is not required. So therefore, a plant, and we know that from other RNA viruses, a plant virus that does not need a particular function might get rid of it through the consequent passages. And this has consequences for certainly the ecology of the virus. We are assessing the resistance status of cassava. The resistance status or the susceptibility status or the virus status, thus the response of cassava towards virus infections and the virus infections are generated with our diversity, core diversity reference viruses. Our measure is not necessary symptom severity. Our measure is not necessary a phenotype. But our measure is the virus content, the virus load, how the plant responds to the virus. So we are interested in the interaction between the virus and the plant, and the plant and the virus, not necessarily taking into account severity of symptoms, severity of symptom phenotype. So we start from this side in order to come up and meet at some stage the field and the breeders who assess phenotypes. So when we do that, and <clears throat> we assess the infection that we generate, um, we can say that we have on one side plants that cannot be infected. And we call these plants, they are resistant. And we can on the other side have plants that are infectable. And these plants are susceptible plants. And Doing this with cassava brown streak virus, we can also see another plant group of plants that are plants that are susceptible but that cannot be, cannot be infected very easy. So they are susceptible once you get the virus in, but it's very, very difficult to infect them because of whatever physical or other barriers that prevent us from getting an infection. We use very harsh conditions because we are interested in how the plant responds. So we want to eliminate infectability. We also want to eliminate that some of the viruses are fairly slow to infect the plant. So we use enormously harsh conditions in order to just realize that if we call a plant resistant, the plant really is. Now, in cassava viruses, we always have the discrimination between susceptible, recovery resistant, and resistant. In the cassava brown viruses, there is susceptibility 
and resistance, but the other term is differential resistance. So a plant that is resistance against one virus and not resistance against the other, or resistant against the other. And this has to be differentiated. So as you can see here, we are not speaking about a disease. We are speaking about viruses. We dissect this. We resolve this. And this is very important for the field evaluation. So, cassava brownsweet virus is a disease where we have cassava that is susceptible and cassava that is resistant. And we also have cassava lines or varieties that have a differential resistance. And one variety that has a differential resistance is a variety that you see here. This is a chimeric plant with, on the left side, a sensitive and susceptible rootstock. Here you see um, the symptoms of cassava brown streak on it. And this symptom here is from the Ugandan cassava brown streak virus. And you see on the other side here a craft partner. And this craft partner is there since more than one year. And this craft partner is called TMS 30572. It's a very famous variety. So a very famous African variety remains free of symptoms, remains free of the virus for almost the entire lifespan while the rootstock is infected. And the reason is that this 30572 is immune or cannot be infected with Ugandan cassava brown strain virus. However, if you would infect this plant with cassava brown strain virus, that is the other virus species causing cassava brown strain disease, this plant can die within four weeks after inoculation. So 30572 has a very high sensitivity against cassava brown strain virus and it's immune against Uganda cassava brown strain virus. And this is very important for disease assessment because if you're doing the disease assessment in an area where you only have Uganda cassava brown strain virus or a disease assessment in an area where you only have cassava brown strain or Uganda or cassava brown strain virus then you come up with entirely different assessment on the virus status and the resistance status of this very important African crop plant. So when we now summarize what we have learned about the cassava responses towards infections with mosaic virus and Brownstreet viruses, we can see that a susceptible plant will always inevitably show symptoms against the mosaic viruses. And even if it's not like a very severe infection, what we see here with this leaf curling and severe mosaic, all susceptible plants will eventually show up symptoms. And these symptoms in cassava can be seen in a susceptible variety very soon after infection. What we have learned from the virus transmission biology is that cassava mosaic viruses are very rapidly infected and transmitted by Bemisa tabaki and that Bemisa tabaki remains viruliferous throughout the lifetime. Because of this, Screening for resistance in the field is fairly easy because we have a highly efficient vector transmitted a virus disease that inevitably results in symptoms. In contrast, when we are looking at cassava brown strip viruses, the symptoms are not as evident. And indeed, if 
we are considering a plant symptom in these leaves. In the field, they are often expressed only at a very, very far end of infection. And if it's considered that mostly those disease symptoms are seen on older leaves that are dropping during the life cycle of a plant, you will end up in a plant that does not show any symptoms. So field evaluation for cassava brown streak virus resistance is very difficult. And often, if we also consider that the most impact from the disease comes from the impact and the necrosis on the roots, most of the time virus screening or identification of or assessment of roots symptoms is the last thing and the only thing to be done. So in contrast to the mosaic diseases, Kazawa Brownswick diseases are very difficult, if not almost impossible to screen for them in the field, because we have a very, very difficult transmission biology, because the vectors transmit this disease very erratic. And we can almost assume that transmission is probably happening not within only one season, but requires multiple seasons and multiple infections of the virus. So virus resistance screening of these two groups of viruses is very complicated because cassava Brownswick virus resistance follows completely different transmission biology and also the virus progress in the plant cannot be as easily seen as for cassava mosaic viruses. And this has to be taken into account. But it also has to be taken into account that for cassava mosaic virus we have the CMD2, CMD3 type of uh, resistance networks or genes that provide a complete resistance. This resistance is what has been shown also in our work results in a, in a plant that cannot be infected. And it's very broad spectrum. So from Sri Lankan cassava mosaic virus in Asia to East African cassava mosaic virus Uganda in East and Central Africa, all plants that carry the CMD2, CMD3 resistances are immune. They cannot be infected. And this is a broad basis of in, uh, resistance that has so far not been found to be broken by any of the virus recombinants that are occurring. Virus assessment for cassava Brownswick viruses is quite difficult and when we use this for the assessment of resistance is even more complicated. And this is because of the fact that virus symptoms are either very late Virus transmission is erratic. Sometimes virus symptoms can only be seen on route, and this is at the end of the seasons when harvesting is done. But it also is because of the virus themselves. As you can see here, we have a plant that does not show any symptoms. Also, this plant is infected with a very severe Ugandan cassava mosaic virus symptom. And this is because this plant has a differential resistance. So it is 30572 that is immune against UCPSV. However, when you infect the same plant with cassava brown streak virus, you will see that these plants succumb to the disease. So we have a differential resistance in African varieties because of the two different viruses. And if you do not know the occurrence, incidence, distribution of the virus on the continent, it's very difficult because you would access a variety 
has resistance, also it's susceptible against the other virus. So this is a very important consideration. As you also see here, similarly, this is a cassava variety from which CMD2 is derived. So one of the origins of CMD2 is TME3. And this TME3 plant is infected with a mixed infection of EACMV and Ugandan cassava mosaic virus. And what you see here is that this plant does not show any symptoms and is immune against EACMV. However, expresses Ugandan cassava mosaic virus resistances. So we have resistances, differential resistances, and the problem that in cassava mosaic virus it's very easy to see symptoms, while it's very, very complicated to show and to screen for resistance against cassava brown streak viruses because of the very, very difficult transmission biology the different viruses and the differential resistance in cassava genotypes.